Aloha and welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii with Dennis Isaki. Today we'll talk about politics and housing with John Wahi, the former governor built housing of homes in Hawaii. We had a mandate of 60% affordable for developers, passed by the legislature. We also had an active team, a fast track mandate for certain housing projects. Don, for the few that may not know of your accomplishments, especially the millennial and the Malihini, please tell us a little about yourself, what you, yeah. have, done, what you have done, and how is politics involved in getting things done? Yeah, I think um, a lot of people don't realize the politics involved in Hawaii uh, housing. You know, we are Hawaii issues, but mostly, you know, a lot of people talk about it. But when I, I was elected governor in 1986, and at that time, the it was the, the 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 state's position was generally that they should only be uh, responsible for doing um, low low rental uh, low income rental housing. I mean, and there were some programs like uh, set out to do that to loan money to the developers. But there was also this growing um, need uh, uh, for generally housing in general. I mean, it was tough to buy a house, you know, it just, not, and it was, it was uh, first of all, it was not necessarily available. And number two, it was expensive. And so the first part of the of politics in housing is to understand why. And essentially, the reason why housing was so expensive in Hawaii and so unavailable was because of monopoly. We essentially had three landowners, three major developers, and three suppliers. And everything was neatly uh, done with the three of them. So if you're a landowner, the last thing you want to do is flood the market. Uh, if you're a developer, you want to make sure that your developments sell out before you begin a new one. And you also want to develop for the part of the market that's going to pay you the most money. Now, you couple these factors with uh, the fact that uh, everything had to come from the mainland and hence the supply chain. And you really got uh, a situation where housing uh, would not be as available as as uh, as maybe it should be. On top of all of that, what you had was the, at that time uh, the Japanese bubble. So this is like the late eighties, I mean middle eighties through, uh, and, and so we had foreign money pouring into Hawaii, buying up a real estate. So the first problem is you know something. This is the political situation. So how do you deal with it, you know? Well, the first step, obviously, is to uh, find allies. In politics, you need to have people who are, agree with you, who are going to help you. I mean, it's, it's in a sense, the numbers game. And I was fortunate uh, at that time, uh, <laughs> one of the first allies was, uh, was a, the president of the Senate, Richard Wong. Now, prior to my election, Richard was an antagonist to the executive branch. So his politics was anti anybody with the executive. And, uh, and so, you know, but then I got elected and he and I, and he actually campaigned against me then. You, you need to know that. He actually campaigned against me. A lot of people did. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the second ally campaigned against me as well, talking about <laughs> politics. And, and because, uh, you know, and so R Richard and I worked out an, an arrangement. Basically, what we did was uh, I met, I, we met and we uh, looked at, you know, looked, uh, looked at each other and said, okay, the past is the past. So I asked him, I said, Dickie, what do you want to do? Why is it that you elected? And then he looked at me and he, he told me, you know, he, he, sincerely, he says, God, what I've always wanted to do 
is build housing for the people of Hawaii. And I told him, fantastic, count me, count me, you know. Then the second ally was, uh, was at that time, was uh, <laughs> Kawakami, uh, from um, Representative Kawakami from uh, Kauai, from your Richard. island. Richard. Richard Kawakami, you know. And Richard was actually, at the time of my election, involved with a political battle between him and the Speaker of the House, then Henry Peter. So I remember getting the two of them together at my house, which was Washington Place, you know, and, and trying to bring about some kind of resolution, which eventually happened. And again, Richard, what do you want to do? What do you think is the most critical issue? He said, how's it? No, I got the Senate, the two leaders. By the way, Richard Kawakami campaigned against me. <laughs> he was, uh, you know, I got everybody else on the Hawaii delegation, Kauai delegation to support me. But uh, Dennis Yamada was my campaign chairman, you know, and, uh, and no, well, not, and Clay Kagawa. Clay Kagawa was right. my campaign chairman, but Dennis was, you know, like he's helping me right. and so forth. Richard was on the other side with my opponent. Starting, uh, and, and anyway, make a long story short, we all agreed, we all sat down, and that was the first step. The next political ally that we needed was somebody who might be already doing it. The third person on this triumvirate was Frank Fossey. Frank Fossey was the chairman, I mean, was the mayor of uh, Honolulu. And Frank had decided that government should never be restricted to only one kind, one side of the street. And if Hawaii needs housing, he was going to start building housing in the villages, uh, uh, ever villages, out in ever. So he was starting the idea of working with development getting all together, coming together, the next thing that was needed, the next political thing that was needed in this scenario was a private partner. You know, if you're going to have a monopoly with land, who is it, who is it that we could partner with that could break that monopoly that already had land? Campbell Estate, out at Kapolei had been trying to develop something out there for a generation and nothing was happening. So we went out and we essentially made a deal with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Campbell and said, look, you give us the land, we'll put up the infrastructure, we'll put this together. That's the next piece in this whole political puzzle. Where it started to get really interesting is at that point, it became obvious that if we are going to build housing the way we should, we needed to have the ability within the state to actually do it. And I think uh, w one of the first things that happened was that then we created, uh, at that time, the state, uh, as, as it is now, by the way, uh, the state handled all of its housing initiatives with the same agency, and that was HHA. And so these are the people that, uh, they, you know, these are the people who manage housing for uh, people who, uh, essentially low-income people who were renting housing for the state. As well as supposed to be developing it. But what happens when you put both of these activities together is generally one dominates the other. And uh, we never really developed housing because of the problems with having to daily manage housing. So we split it. And as a matter of fact, I think you got appointed to the board of the new development agency. That's Thank you for supporting my election <laughs> instead of going with Richard and the rest of these guys, you know? But anyway, yeah, and so we that that was the split. 
another part of doing that was it became apparent that, um, okay, now we had people who were committed to the development of politics. We had a landowner who was willing to play. We had a legislature who, uh, whose leadership was committing to see it, uh, seeing this through. And all of these pieces were starting to come together. At that point, we needed a process that developers could go through. And that's when Act 15 came about and, and the rest of it. I should tell you uh, that <laughs> the relationship with the city sort of changed because what, we, what Act 15 actually did was it bypassed city zoning. It bypassed, it went straight, uh, basically the state uh, created its, its own uh, rules for, for beginning the, what is now called the villages of Kapolei. Yeah, and, and the, another good thing about it is it was a fast track. Well, the fast yeah, track was yeah. part of it. Yeah. So you could move faster, yeah. right? Yeah. So all of this, Passing it, though, was a kind of a challenge because the first thing was I, <laughs> um, I uh, asked, uh, I, I called the, the city council and we presented this idea that we were going to be fast tracking, we were going to be direct uh, zoning. And I asked, asked, actually asked them to participate in this and, and uh, see, and um, they, they were very upset. <laughs> They let, they walked out of the meeting and all of that, and we had a, but, you know, fine. We had to get it done. And uh, Frank, meanwhile, was building his villages at ever. And in the process of doing all of that, what Frank was realizing was that we, these types of housing uh, initiatives, not only, um, they were being supported in terms of the infrastructure by taxpayers' money. They were also being uh, done at the time when housing prices were going through the ceiling because of artificial expenditures from foreign buyers, the essentially Japanese uh, investors. And so he decided that um, what he needed to do was to, to create what we called extraction. So if a developer wanted to build housing on this kind of land, in this type of project, or in general, they had to uh, meet certain price line requirements. And he basically started the idea of extracting. And when he started doing that with the city, I had... Uh, our administration, meanwhile, had created the Office of State Planning with Harold Matsumoto. And we controlled the Land Use Commission, just like Frank controlled, in a sense, with the city council the zoning that was needed, which we had bypassed. And so, <laughs> but we had the Land Use Commission. And I asked Harold, and some of my cabinet members, I think Warren Price and a number of other people, Warren was my attorney general. What would be a reasonable extraction? And at that point in time, we looked up the existing law, existing state law for state project was that the uh, there was going to be a 60% requirement that the, that the number of units being built had to be for moderate and low income people. So, and that began what you call the 60%. Yeah, I know that the developers weren't too happy with that. But the thing is that, uh, you know, with the Act 15, we could fast track the different levels of housing, you know, moderate income market, and, you know, profits from that would help subsidize the lower uh, income group, which, which was good. But like you said, the, the city and county, you know, wasn't too happy with 
the, the Act 15. So it will, if, even on the uh, inspection of the roadways and stuff, they didn't do that over here. We had to do that ourselves, right? Yeah. And they didn't even accept some of the roads, I understand. Well, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a whole continuing issue. Yeah. But what was interesting was, actually, it depended, uh, you know, at first, but, uh, and, and subsequently. But initially, uh, most developers w went along with that because there was enough money to be made on the market housing because the market was so intense at that time in the beginning, in the early part of the 80s. Then the last, so we had the 60%, uh, 60 which wasn't that easy to get people to accept, you know, initially because people, Frank actually ended up adopting the same standard. So both the state and the city were requiring um, 60% of the houses be made for uh, made affordable. The last part of this whole scenario that had to be put together. So now we had a process, we had a target, we needed developers. We had to get new developers in, in uh, because I think uh, outside of Oceanic, um, a gentry and what, what I, uh, I guess uh, somebody else. But there, there was only like three developers in the state. So the first developer <coughs> that we had was, uh, we, we decided to see whether somebody from outside could help us put together. Because they had to meet the 60% requirement. And the person who actually found it was, the, I had a housing consultant. He was the former controller for the previous administration. His name was Hideo Murakami. And Hideo and, a, and his uh, bunch of staff, uh, people that he worked with at HFDC found, uh, found this developer called Watt, which is who's still in Hawaii, Watt, Watt's house. And what we did was we had divided Kapolei up into, I think it was seven or eight different housing developments. And so the, we went out and invited people to bid for this with these requirements for, for the rights to develop. And the first village was won by, by uh, what? Who meant that we now had competition. Interesting in this story is the fact that the second village, and I think the one after that, was won by a young guy. I, I wouldn't call him a kid, but he looked like a kid back then from Maui. And he, at that point in time, he had only built something like 25 houses in his whole life. And here he was bidding to build over a thousand houses in Kapolei. And I remember meeting with Hideo and a bunch of the guys who were involved, Harold Mosimoto and a bunch of these guys who were involved in the housing initiative, and having them come to me and say, hey, God, you know, this young guy, he, he's got a great plan. And I looked at it and I said, well, how many houses has he actually built? He said, well, less, you know, less than 30. Are you guys are nuts? We're going to bet our whole program on this young guy who's never built a thing? This is talking now. This is straight how, you know, things, how sausage is made. And they said, you know, God, you keep talking about how we need new people in the system, how we need to support local people, you know, we can't go keep bringing guys from the mainland. We gotta start looking around. And I said, okay, so finally I agreed with him. I said, fine, give them the first village. And Stanford Carr, who is one of Hawaii's premier developers, came out of nowhere from Maui and built the first, of uh, uh, the second village at Kapolei. And not only did he build the village, he won an award 
I think it was supposed to be like the third best development in in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the country. Yeah, I, I believe. Built, yeah. I huh? believe he, he had the partner. Was that Franco Mola or? Well, he he had partners, a number. Yeah. He partners, put together yeah. A, yeah. a number of people and and, fi and the financing and the financing yeah. and all the rest of it, which goes into a housing project, right? Right. Which is the and then, but in the second village that he put together, which he built, the, what was in effect the third village, a couple of people. You go out there now; it's a city. Back then, when all of this started, as you know, it was all field, just vacant land, because the sugar industry that had been uh, all the sugarcane fields had closed down. And Campbell, well, Oahu, in fact, the entire state was on its way out in terms of, I mean, sugar was on its way out as an industry. And, you know, so here you go, Stanford, Bill, he wins an award. And you see, this, all of these things had a relationship to what was the cause. What was the cause of housing being uh, as tight as it was in the state? So you needed political will to get it done. You needed uh, all of these things. and But most of all, you needed some new blood. You needed some new players. That's why guys like you came from Kauai to work on projects over here. We needed to also support local businesses. So if you hired the people, you developed the programs, you're not only reducing costs to the consumers, you're also giving engineers, architects, everybody else uh, a chance to, uh, to prosper and to keep the industry strong. So yeah, politics in Hawaii was, this is the, this is the big picture of politics in Hawaii. The bad part of politics in Hawaii is sometimes this whole system can get misused and end up with um, driving costs up instead of you know, helping people. It's just like the industry, okay? We used to be number one in, Hawaii, uh, in the world for production of sugarcane. Number one in the world for production uh, for pineapple and, and the rest, you know? And nobody could compete with us, even with sugar in Hawaii, because on a fair basis, without subsidization. So people used to talk about how, you know, these agricultural industries are being subsidized, like sugar, it was 18 cents a pound, what it meant was that you couldn't buy sugar internationally. So Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, the rest of these cola companies couldn't buy sugar internationally that cost less than 18 cents a pound. Why was that necessary? Because everybody else in the world was subsidizing sugar. Yeah, I, I, this is kind of a long start to make a point, but the point is, for example, my wife's relatives in Okinawa was getting 50 cents a pound from the government to do the sugar, okay? So we maintained 18 cents. All of a sudden, you come in and the pineapple industry, dull pineapple, which is now oceanic, comes in, and into the trade negotiations, which are taking place with, uh, on the national level and which the state of Hawaii had always supported our industries, our delegation, and all of this, Dole had been sold to a, a gentleman called Murda, and they come in and they all of a sudden says, we don't want any tariff. We don't want any tariff. We're not gonna take any subsidy. And they refused. What they didn't tell people was that Dole had bought all these lands in the Philippines and in Thailand, and they were starting to plant Hawaii pineapple in 
They didn't want any tariffs bringing that pineapple into Hawaii. So they were closing down their property. And in closing down their properties, their choice was, we got to build houses. We're going to build houses out at Mililani and elsewhere instead of raising pineapple. You see, this is the switch. When that happened, they came in and asked the state for zoning. They wanted zoning changes. They needed zoning. They needed to be going from agricultural lands to not. Again, what is the politics of all of this? Politics is this big corporation who had just gotten bought out, wanted to grow cheaper, use cheaper labor and cheaper land elsewhere and didn't want a tariff bringing things in. See? At that point, the Land Use Commission said, and they were the first, they were the first coming up on this issue. If you are going to build houses, fine, but your housing has to be for the people of life, which means you now have a 60% requirement. See, the transition of industry was also a political issue that had to be dealt with in the housing business. Because all of the lands that we are now having for housing used to be in a different industry, used to create jobs and fed families. Okay, Tom, we're wrapping up. We've got one minute left. That kind of, you know, leads to uh, government involvement. You talked about that. And then in housing, we had the, you had the dwelling unit revolving fund. You get the home revolving fund. That was All later. De- yeah, later, later it was defunded. You know, they're trying to put it back now, but I think that led to less, less housing. Well, what they did was they undid a lot of the projects that we did. You know, and unfortunately, some of the my successors, both at the city and at the uh, state level, uh, decided that housing was not their business because at that point in time, by the time you get, well, uh, right after me, uh, and you get through the 90s, when you get into the 2000s, what happened was there was this deliberate uh, attempt to say that you know, housing was pretty much satisfied. Let the market do it and get yeah. rid of the program. Yeah, you get uh, any last comments, Tom? Not for me, except that I think that what we need is we need to get serious about housing again. And a lot of the same reasons why housing prices are as high as it is has to do with these same factors that we just discussed. Yeah. Especially and, uh, now, instead of Japanese buyers, we, we, we got uh, foreign buyers from it or elsewhere, driving up the cost of house. Yeah, we got the new Kinsura Power Motors. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, come from other countries. Um, yeah, and at that time, we had the uh, HFTC 30 years ago, you had a billion dollars in assets. You know, <laughs> now, you know, you don't have that much. Well, in a way, th- thank you. Um, you've been watching politics on Hawaii, on Think Tech Hawaii with John Waihe, former governor. Thanks for participating, Tom. Uh, thanks for letting me do this, because normally I'm the host, and I don't get a chance to talk that much, so, <laughs> and I really overdid it today. So yeah, no, no, we're great. We, we uh, started running out of time. We could spend another hour on this, and mahalo to our viewers for tuning in. I'm Dennis Esaki. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Politics in Hawaii. Aloha.